military style casual strategy when niggas battle me. My problems are prediction. Switch and move position. Separated from his gun and bitch and watch him start snitching. I keep spitting still, stupid niggas fail to listen. I'm a certified as thug living hell of prison. My ammunition varies, my voice carries. Watch me invite the whole world, me and the mob getting married. It seems horrifying, springs pierce the dark. Disrespect a trick, bitch. Where's your heart? You mark. Watch niggas fall when I call they name. We outlaws so on your head, niggas all the same. Except some want more out of life distress. We still thug until it's none left. Murder and pain sleep. come with the game if you choose. Everybody go to jail, come out, they got good luck. And within hours, his luck ran out. Mary and Chuck Knight, chairman of Death Row Records, and Tupac Shakur. Everybody go to jail, come out, they got good luck. Everybody go to jail, come out, they got good luck. And within hours, his luck ran out. Mary and Chuck Knight, chairman of Death Row Records, and Tupac Shakur. Everybody go to jail, come out, they got good luck. And within hours, his luck ran out. Mary and Chuck Knight, chairman of Death Row Records, and Tupac Shakur. name on it, then it's going to be either you go with it, watch it, or you don't. I don't care. It's a free country. Go where you want to. If you want to feel good about things, if you want to look around the corner and see the boogeyman in every corner and think that Reggie Wright's the, the, the son of Satan who does everything possible, then, the, you know, fine. Knock yourselves out. You want to see Malcolm Patton at the MGM Hotel doing security when he was in his late teens, knock yourself out. Okay? That's what you want to believe Knock yourself out. Go believe that, okay? It's not what I believe, but just because I don't believe it, you might believe it, I don't believe it, or I'm still waiting for further confirmation. Everybody go to jail, come out, they got good luck. And within hours, his luck ran out. Mary and Chuck Knight, chairman of Death Row Records, and Tupac Shakur. I guess the meat and potatoes in this is, did he explain to you what he thought happened the night that him and Tupac were shot? Yes. You want me to go through that? What he yeah, told me? Okay. So the caravan to Vegas. And I believe that the bodyguards that they were using for them that were also at the fight, or they, saw, they saw some other bodyguards. There was another, actually, fight that was, uh, or like a confrontation, I think, between Tupac uh, and somebody else there, you know, at that fight, you know, in Las Vegas. So they leave. You know, they get in the car. I'm, just, I'm trying to simplify it also. Um, they get in the car with their security following them, and another car pulls, a, you know, aside of them. And Shug said to me that it was the bodyguards that were working at the fight, you know. And they fired at both Shug and Tupac, and Shug said he took a 45 slug in the back of his head or to the side of his skull. This is what Suge told me. Maybe it grazed him or something to that effect. And Tupac had gotten hit. And they were both, you know, uh, and then the, I think the police finally got involved and pulled them over, pulled everybody over. And, you know, they were both laughing about getting shot, you know, while, while they were driving and all of that. And then they rushed both of them to the hospital. And they took Tupac to, you know, one part, and they had Suge in another room. You know, something to that effect. But that was really the gist of it. You know, he he never saw, you know, Tupac, you know, obviously after that. Didn't see his body, didn't see anything. But they were laughing the whole time after they got shot. So that's him. He, he said that bodyguards were the trigger? Man? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Or, hired, you know, hired, you know, to do this. I mean, it, it, was, it was premeditated. And these guys were hired. Uh-huh. That's what Shug told me. So, hello guys, it's JMix here, and I just wanted to provide a little background and context to the interview that you're about to hear. Recently, I got to speak to Chris Nassif, who was a longtime talent agent in Hollywood, and he's currently a producer on several projects, including Jeepers Creepers 3. You might know his brother, Paul. He's a co-star on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. But for the longest time, he was a talent agent. And through a mutual friend, we got to talking, and I and I was able to talk to him about some of the work he'd done. Um, in this conversation, Suge Knight was brought up because he did have a meeting with Suge Knight several years ago where Suge Knight was pitching an idea for a television show. 
Now, Mr. Nassif is a novice to the Tupac case. He doesn't follow, you know, what's going on with Christopher Wallace or any of these things. So I asked him to recall the conversation to the best of his knowledge of what Suge Knight told him regarding the murders. So this is part of that interview I would like you to take a listen to. I just wanted you to keep in mind that Mr. Nassif ran the prestigious Diverse Media Group. It is the world's 10th largest talent agency. So the pedigree on this guy is outstanding. What you're about to hear on this audio could very well jeopardize this man's opportunities to go back to being a talent agent. But he was willing to go on record and this is his story. And if somebody wants to call me some sort of a gatekeeper, he told yeah, me, okay, so the caravan to Vegas, and I believe that the bodyguards that they were using for them that were also at the fight, but they, saw, they saw some other bodyguards. There was another, actually, fight that was, uh, or like a confrontation, I think, between Tupac uh, and somebody else there, you know, at that fight, you know, in Las Vegas. So they leave. You know, they get in the car. I'm, just, I'm trying to simplify it also. Um, they get in the car with their security following them, and another car pulls, a, you know, aside of them. And Shug said to me that it was the bodyguards that were working at the fight, you know. And they fired at both Shug and Tupac, and Shug said he took a 45 slug in the back of his head or to the side of his skull. This is what Shug told me. Maybe it grazed him or something to that effect. And Tupac had gotten hit. And they were both, you know, uh, and then the, I think the police finally got involved and pulled them over, pulled everybody over. And, you know, they were both laughing about getting shot, you know, while, while they were driving and all of that. And then they rushed both of them to the hospital. And they took Tupac to, you know, one part and they had Shug in another room. You know, something to that effect. But that was really the gist of it. You know, he he never saw, you know, Tupac, you know, obviously after that. Didn't see his body, didn't see anything. But they were laughing the whole time after they got shot. So that's him. He, he said that bodyguards were the trigger? Man? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Or, hired, you know, hired, you know, to do this. I mean, it, it, was, it was premeditated. mentioned Tupac at the Frank Bruno and Mike Tyson fight. There was a song out there, You Ain't Got A Lot Of To Kick It. Was that about Tupac and Mike Tyson not having having problems? No, Mike Tyson and Tupac were great friends when um, uh, Mike was locked up in uh, Indiana uh, on those uh, rape charges and uh, Tupac was locked up. They were writing each other back and forth and that's how they became friends. And uh, Mike and Pot never had a, a, a problem, never. Uh, Pot uh, did uh, all of the uh, music for uh, Mike's uh, entry uh, coming into the ring. Yeah, I was in that, uh, that documentary that uh, Reggie uh, By- Bywood did, that One Night in Vegas uh, piece. Oh, you talking he, about the, for, uh, the yes. Mike Tyson thing? Yeah, that he did for ESPN, on, the 30, uh, 30 for 30. ESPN 3030? Yeah, he, he mentioned all that in that piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to take you guys off your path, but uh, I was really disappointed about that uh, whole thing that ESPN did with Mike Tyson. What well, made you disappointed? Why is that? Um, one, um, there was, it was a twist on it the way they wanted it to be. <laughs> uh, I actually tried to get a hold of them, and I sent um, uh, messages to uh, the uh, director that was putting that piece together, which was a brother. and um, Resi Rock even, Byfoot. 
Uh, they didn't, yeah, they didn't even call me back. But um, the guy that took the last picture of Tupac, he was they uh, had him in there, and um, he lied. This guy flat out lied through his teeth. He said that he asked Tupac could he take that picture of him. Now, I want everybody that's listening, especially all the Tupac fans, please hear this. How did this guy ask Tupac could he take that picture of him? when he was sitting in the car at the red light and the guy had to have been across the street, way across the street to have taken that picture. So as the car was facing um, uh, east on Flamingo, because that's the direction we were going, he would have to have come over to the car, walk to the car and ask Pac, can I take this picture? No, you talking about the fans picture with... Pac and, Pac and Shug in the car. The last picture ever taken of Tupac. That guy lied through his teeth about that picture. All right? And I hope he's listening out there. And if anybody didn't know him, you let him know that I'm saying he's lying through his teeth. That's one. Two, um, <laughs> Bruce Seldon lied. Bruce Seldon said that Tupac stopped over in his dressing room to, to speak to him. <laughs> Okay, all of this is in my book. All of this is in my book about what happened that night. First of all, when we left from the M, uh, from the uh, MGM and went back over to the Lexor Hotel uh, after Pac had been gambling that day, um, Pac had me go upstairs and change clothes. He had the other uh, security that was with us, Michael Moore, stay with him while I changed clothes. Um, Pac went up and changed clothes. Uh, after uh, I came back uh, down, and Michael Moore, he told him to go change clothes and meet us. We're not talking about the boxer, Michael Moore, are we? No, no, we're talking about the uh, other security that was with me. His name is Michael Moore. Okay. He told him to come and uh, meet us over at the MGM. So Tupac and I got in a cab. We got in a cab, and we went over to the MGM. That's where he had on the blue, uh, blue jeans and the gold sh- uh, shirt. We get over there. It was so crazy. It was so crowded. Everybody saw him. They were screaming, Tupac, Tupac, and they are trying to get at him. So I uh, got the attention of the uh, security, MGM security, and I had them uh, walk us around the crowd on the other side of the ropes to get to the uh, Grand, Grand Garden Arena area. So they get us over there. Now, we're, uh, there's, there's a roll of telephones there. We're uh, at those telephones. And we're walking back and forth. We're pacing. Pac is pacing. He's mad because Suge Knight is late getting there with the tickets. And the fight is about to start. When Suge Knight showed up, he had uh, another gentleman with him. So he had four tickets. Himself, the other gentleman who I didn't know, Pac and myself. And we went into the fight and we sat ringside. We went into the fight as the national anthem had just started. And as we were walking... We, I was like, we got to stop, you know, because I'm, I'm, you know, from the Marine Corps. We got to stop. I got to put my hand on my chest, you know. Uh, and and Pac and Shug, they were walking. And that's where I was playing. <laughs> we were walking, going to our seats. So we get down there skip, to our seats and we sit <laughs> down. Skip, skip. We leave uh, after, after the fight. I mean, the fight was, what, a minute and 50 seconds? If that. You know, if that, right? Yeah. Pac knocked him out. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 that well, hold on. That, that fight came later. Hit that fight up. did come later. <laughs> Mike Hail knocked Mary. him out. Right, right. Mike knocked him out. And as soon as Mike knocked him out, uh, Suge said, "Let's go." So we get up. We go in the back. Now the BET cameras catch us in the back, and they show Tupac in the BET cameras, and I'm in the background, and Suge Knight is next to Pac, smiling. And Pac is like, 50 blows, 50 blows, did you see it? 50 blows, did you count them? 50 blows, he hit him 50 times. Knocked him out. Right, he's all excited. Right. So we, um, uh, we're in the back. When did, here's the, uh, the point to this, when did Tupac have time to talk to Bruce Seldon? They interviewed him, and he said Tupac stopped by and spoke to him and this and that. And Bruce Seldon is the analysis or the, the guy for ESPN you're saying, right? Exactly. They interviewed him in that, and he lied. He flat okay. out lied. Now,
do that, then there's no reason for us to breathe the same air. What would you think of? Well, of course, loss is going to come along and you're going to have like hurdles and bumps in the road, you know, but my mission, my in entire mission for the rest of my life is to figure out a way to enjoy the rest of my life because you never, never know when you're going to clock out. You know what I mean? So I agree. I want to, I want to make sure every breath I take is a good one. Looking like in a different perspective, I look at life and um, and my purpose is probably just to inspire my life is no meaning. Your per yeah, what the fuck are you talking I, about? That's how I look. I don't look at you. Life. Have been so fucking inspirational, yeah, but to not, so many people. Track record studio, South Studio. We got a call on a Monday, Tuesday, I think it was, that we were going to actually do a song for Mike Tyson. Uh, Tupac was going to come in, lay some lyrics down on a beat that we made, and we were going to ship it off to Vegas so that way they can play it during the fight. Uh, we came in for a couple of days, busted out the beat, got a call Friday morning saying Pac's going to show up, make sure we're on point, make sure you're ready when he comes in. He's all right, he's got a tight schedule. So he's going to come in for a couple hours, he's going to lay the lyrics. Then you're going to mix it, and then we're going to send it off. Pac would allow me, um, I was talking to him, he would send me music where I come out to the music in my fights. So um, he would make the tape, ask him to tape me, he said, no, I'm going to make it tomorrow. So I always called and asked him, but the tape is going to be ready for the fight, because it's getting close. Comes out the limo, walks in the door, says, what's up? Walks right into the room, started playing the beat, said, turn it up, cranked it up for him, let him feel it. The man listened down maybe two, three times at most. Within 15 minutes, the track I think was about six minutes long. He listened down about three times. Had everything, pad and paper in his hand, was the whole time he would listen. Just writing, just writing, just writing, just writing. Yo, roll a blunt, writing, writing. Where's my Hennessy? Writing, writing. Next you know it, he stops tape, let's do it. Less than 20 minutes from the time the man walked into the door to the time he walked out of that room, 20 minutes, the song was done. And then he tells me, he says, all right, dude, hey, man, it was great working with you. I appreciate everything you did. And he said, I'll be back Sunday. The night before that fight, I was out, and I went outside the um, MGM Grand. I think it was, and um, it was just a bunch of friends of mine outside. So we hung out and we talked for a long time that night. I must have went to bed around 1 o'clock that night because we were outside just talking and talking. It's a bunch of friends just talking, entertaining the actors, and we just talking, having fun, and then I had to go. Um, it, it relaxed me. I never did that before, a fight before, but it, it, I was just truly relaxed. I came home, um, woke up the next morning, ate breakfast, um, watched television, made, call, talked to some people on the phone, and um, when time came to fight, we got in the car and we, ran, and we rode to the MGM um, Grand, and I just sat in my dressing room watching the fights on the scanner. Tupac Shakur, he came in my dressing room. You know, he just popped his head in there and he's like, good luck, man, good luck, good luck. And I leaped up and ran over to him, shook his hand, because he never came in, he just stayed at the door. Shook his hand and he turned and walked on out.
I will warn you twice, the third time, or take a point away. Obey my command, shake hands, good luck. Specifically, did something happen in the Selden fight? I don't know. But it, 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 was, it was a big night in terms of winning, but, but something in the career caused Mike to go downhill from, from, from that point, in my opinion. Uh, he lost three of his last four fights against guys he would have destroyed earlier in his career. I was just happy that I won. I ran into um because Pac and shit was right in the front row. I ran and I hugged both of those guys. We walked into the dressing room. I told them I would see them later. At that particular time, I just had a brand new baby girl, so I wanted to go see my daughter. And I said, in a few minutes, I'm going to call you after I see my daughter, and then we're going to go hang out. Pac going to stick his chest out and bust him in his mouth. And so that would happen. It's almost like the adrenaline of the night was still with everybody. You know, that thing you have when a guy gets knocked out in the first round and everybody's, wow, that's amazing, that's incredible, wow. you know. People are jacked up. I remember walking out of MGM when that occurred. And I remember about to call my phone to say to Shook, hey, y'all be careful type of thing. But then it was something in me that was tired. You know what I mean? It had seen, I had seen so much, you know, just tired of preaching, trying to get everybody to, can we, you know, I was Rodney King, can we all get along? You know, it was just, I, I just was tired that day. I just felt like, come on, let's go to the party. If you look at it, everything seemed crazy that night in Vegas. looked like a good punch but how solid was it because the crowd thought this guy went down well you know i mean the, the people that complained were the people that had cheap seats they were wearing the top they couldn't see it. well you had a good view tell us what it was yeah, like. I mean, it was a pretty good punch i do there was going to be a party at club 662. you were barely moving you had foot traffic you had the cars a lot of his fans coming out were fight fans but one guy just jumped on someone's car and just you know was hold, he was holding up a t-shirt or something it was like tyson tyson so i uh was Making my way through the traffic, uh, came to a light, and um, cars, you know, were stopping. And uh, I looked over, and it was a BMW, and it had some nice wheels on it. Um, looked over, I saw Pac and Suge in it, and uh, the windows were down. So I, you know, I just hollered at Pac and said, "What's up, Pac?" He said, oh, "What's up, man?" Yeah. Uh, I said, "Where are you guys uh, headed to?" He said, "Oh, we about to go to the club. Uh, you know, you can follow behind us. Come on in." Come with us, brother. Come with us. And uh, I said, all right, cool. I said, all right, let me get a picture real quick. So I uh, grabbed my camera, you know, snapped the picture. And then uh, the light changed green. Then I finally got over, like, about maybe five or six cars behind him. Then we came to another light, and that's what we stopped there. And then um, then uh, well, as we were stopped there, you know, there was uh, we were in, the, in, like, the second lane um, from the curb. And, you know, cars were rolling by on both sides. And then next thing you know, it's like you just heard, you know, bat, 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 bat. When they start shooting, I grab Pac. I pull Pac down. I get shot right here. She'll get kind of like went up on the curb. He caught a flat after he came off the curb. And he made the left turn onto the, uh, to that street. Next thing we know, there's um, cops, like, on bicycles, and then we see the cars rolling up, and then they, uh, they just uh, pulled out their guns. And I hear Shug's like, my man Pac got shot, my man Pac got shot. Man, we need to get to the hospital. I fell to my knees because I could not believe that Tupac was gone. I just couldn't believe it. A lot of despair, a lot of guilt, a lot of, um, just, um, it was just numb. It's really, um, it was really inconceivable to really fathom that happened just now. And I'm just, um, it's very sad. Very sad. He came to see me, you know, he came to see me and we were getting ready to go hang out and I felt if he probably would have just watched it on television and everything would have been, yes, gravy, you know.
car came by, his car, a convertible, with girls in it to tempt him out of the, out of the car, and they pulled off. And a car came by his car, a convertible, with girls in it to tempt him out of the, out of the car, and they pulled off. And a car came by his car, a convertible, with girls in it to tempt him out of the, out of the car, and they pulled off. And a car came by his car, a convertible, with girls in it to tempt him out of the, out of the car, and they pulled off. And a car came by his car, a convertible, with girls in it to tempt him out of the, out of the car, and they pulled off.